want to talk a little bit about general radiography. Um, I'm going to just mention film very briefly before I move on to digital imaging. We, as I asked yesterday, right, there are very few in the room who are still doing much in the way of film imaging, but it's helpful sometimes uh, to, to make analogies to that a little bit. You know, film, we had this silver halide emulsion on this plastic backing, this mylar backing. And when visible light, film does a really nice job stopping visible light. But that thin ha silver halide um, layer really doesn't do a very good job stopping X-ray energies. So instead, we had to put something in front of that that did a better job stopping the X-rays and converting them to visible light that was better matched to the absorption characteristics of the film. <clears throat> In the film days, we talked about the fact that we exposed the film and then we developed the film. And so we really had these issues with these underexposed ranges and these overexposed ranges where you really weren't able to distinguish um, structures anymore because of the poor contrast. And film only worked well in that range. And I put this slide up because it really shows the linear response of digital imaging, which really has a nice response over a very wide range of exposures. So as I mentioned, you know, we, we really need to put something in front of that film since it just does such a poor job stopping those x-rays. And, and films are used to, to uh, screens are used to do that. And there's a very similar thing that we're going to see putting in front of some of our indirect digital detectors. And that's why I still want to talk briefly about screens before we do that. So screens really improve the efficiency. They improve the use of the X-ray energy that makes it through the patient and converting it to our image. Um, so they do a better job stopping those X-ray photons, right? usually made out of a material that has a higher Z than the material that makes up our detector, either the film or our detector elements on a digital detector. Phosphors and scintillators, as I talked about, analogous to screens that we use in our indirect digital imaging. So here comes our X-ray photon in. It strikes this screen material, and it converts this X-ray energy into multiple lower energy light photons. Right? So we see that here. So the good thing is now these are much more easily stopped and detected by a CCD camera or by film in the old days. The, the bad thing is that they disperse out a little bit and therefore co cause some blurring in the image. When we talk about screens, we can talk about this absorption and conversion efficiency, right? Doing a better job kind of converting some of that X-ray energy into lower energy uh, photons that can be used to make the image. And I want to talk briefly about a concept called absorption efficiency and conversion efficiency. So with absorption efficiency, if you just make the screen a little thicker, it'll now stop more of the X-ray photons and convert them to that lower energy light. The downside is there's now a thicker screen for that light to disperse in, so the light has more distance to spread out after it's generated, and so your resolution properties go down a little bit with a thicker screen. So better efficiency, but you sacrifice a little bit of resolution. The other thing you can do is just make them out of a different material, maybe a higher Z material that does a better job stopping your X-rays, and in that case, you now produce maybe more light with uh, that single X-ray photon than you did with your older screen material. So this is the conversion efficiency. The issue here is now you're going to be able to make your X-ray image with fewer X-rays, right? Because each X-ray is going to generate more light from that. And so this increased conversion efficiency does result in a bit of increased noise in your imaging because it's really the incident X-ray photons that determine how much noise was in the image, not how much light is produced. So that's the sacrifice that we play by using different materials to, to stop those X-rays. I next want to talk a little bit about scatter. You know, we've talked about this really being due predominantly to those Compton interactions. Yes, there's a little bit of classic or Rayleigh or coherent scatter, as we call it. This reduces our image contrast. And a lot of imaging that we do, chest radiograph, pelvic radiograph, scatter to primary ratio, the number of detected 
x-rays that were scattered versus ones that were unscattered, scattered to primary ratio, can be three to one, three times as many scattered as opposed to unscattered, or even six to one in, in kind of lateral abdominal or lateral lumbar spine imaging. So we always want to make sure we, we collimate Right? It reduces scatter because it reduces the volume of irradiated tissue. And if you irradiate less tissue, then those x-rays can't end up scattering back into your area of interest. It improves our image contrast, and it also ends up reducing the patient dose. So we always want to make sure we collimate. Okay? Um, scatter is reduced at lower KVP. Uh, that's because there's an increase in the photoelectric interactions the lower the KVP is. But that's not always practical, right? When we're doing a lateral pelvis in an adult, it's not practical because we've at least got to get enough x-rays through them to make an image. And so in that case, if you go to a lower KV, the MA that you have to get is so high that the dose can uh, maybe be prohibitive. So here's that patient, here's our scatter versus primary. There are all those scatters coming out and I, I emphasize again that there's a lot of these here. Many fewer make it through the patient. Here I've shown a scatter to primary ratio hitting the screen that's closer to one to three. And I told you that the true number is actually closer to three to one, right? More scatters than primaries. There those are, that's what we're talking about. We're ignoring everything that was absorbed completely. We're ignoring everything that was backscattered and didn't end up hitting the, the detector or the, the film. So as I mentioned before, right, we're gonna collimate. We're gonna reduce that KV when it's at all possible. We may use an air gap and, gap. and the other thing I wanna talk about is maybe using a grid. I want to make this point quickly though. Here's, a, here's an example where they use some different diameter phantoms and they use different field of view sizes where on that phantom they opened up the field of view to different sizes and they looked at what the scatter to primary ratio was. So look at here, here's a very small phantom, five centimeters. And it, even if the field of view got bigger, there really wasn't a whole lot of scatter. So again, right, pediatric patients, small parts, right? Scatter is not a huge issue there, and that's gonna be important when we talk about grids in a second. Larger patients, getting our field of view size down as small as we can possibly get it to see the area of interest becomes very important to help keep that scatter to primary ratio down. Air gaps also reduce scatter. Does everyone see that if you move the object, the detector away from the object, you give room for some of these scatter events to escape and not strike the detector. So using an air gap can help. And that's why we don't use grids in magnification mammography, right? Because there's an air gap there that helps keep our scatter down. Grids are another way. Grids are very similar, if you will, to the collimator that's used in nuclear medicine, and I want you to keep that analogy in mind here. In nuclear medicine, we're actually gonna use that collimator to focus, if you will, the, the um, gamma ray energy onto the camera. Here, we're gonna use it to reject scatter. So the holes are lined up specifically at a particular distance, at a particular angle, to the x-ray tube. So primaries that aren't changed in terms of their direction should pass through the holes. Yes, occasionally one of the primaries may strike one of the pieces of lead or whatever material it's made out of and not make it through too. So grids reduce the primaries as well as reducing the scatter. It's just that they reduce the scatter much more than they reduce the primaries, okay? So our overall ratio of scatter to primaries gets much better when we use a grid. And there's that grid ratio, the height of the holes divided by the width of the holes. As I mentioned, they decrease both primary and scatter, greater effect on those scatter. Longer and narrower the holes are, the more rejection they give. Grids always require an increase in the number of x-rays, right? Because the number of x-rays that are gonna hit the detector go down with the grid. So you've gotta provide an increased dose to that patient. And the amount of increase in MAS that's required is referred to as the Bucky factor, right? And that's the, an increased dose to the patient there. We usually place the grids are in a little bit of a re reciprocating frame. They vibrate just a little bit. Not even, kind of almost the diameter of the hole width is how much they vibrate back and forth so that you don't see the pattern, right, on the radiograph when, when you look at it. 
So here's if um, the length of the holes divided by the width of the holes were 5, 8, and 12. Notice that holes here convert a 4 to 1 scatter to primary ratio to a 1 to 4 scatter to primary ratio. But the price paid is a need for a 5 times increase in the dose to the patient. All right. Here is a, a chest phantom done with the grid in place. Here's the same phantom done without the grid. And everybody sees the reduction in the contrast that's made because of all the additional scatter. For portable studies, stationary grids are used, and they have lower grid ratios um, and uh, moderate line density. And sometimes you see them, especially if they're not placed very well on the portable studies. I'm sure some of you have seen those artifacts. I'll show you an example there. We already mentioned that small parts, neonatal patients, don't require grids because there's minimal scatter to start with. We certainly don't want to put a grid in there, right? It'll be increased dose that we'll need and when we didn't need the, the grid in the first place. And then here's, here's one of those misaligned grids that you'll see sometimes. This, is, this one's really prominent. Sometimes they don't stand out quite.